Hi, and welcome to the OpenSAT Kit CFE Software Bus tutorial. The CFE Software Bus provides an inter-application message service using a publish subscribe model. Software Bus messages are defined using the CCSDS packet standard. CCSDS is a multinational forum for the development of communications and data system standards for spaceflight. An application that wants to receive messages must first define a software pipe and then subscribe to messages it wants to receive on that pipe. A pipe is essentially a first-in, first-out queue. An application that wants to send a message simply calls the software bus message to send a message. The sending application has no knowledge of who will receive the message. Note that SB pipes can also be used for control flow because receiving apps can pull or pen for messages, in other words, non-blocking or blocking in terms of execution. I'll use the OpenSAT Kit telemetry output app called KitTO to demonstrate some of the software bus features. KitTO's main function is to read telemetry packets sent on the software bus by all of the apps and send the packets to Cosmos over UDP. The telemetry packet table defines which packets should be sent to Cosmos. The default table is defined in kit underscore to underscore packet underscore table dot JSON. KitTO defines two pipes. The KitTO packet pipe receives app telemetry packets. KitTO subscribes to the packets defined in the packet table. KitTO command pipe receives ground commands from KitCI and the housekeeping request from Kit Scheduler. KitTO's main execution loop performs three steps. First, it suspends execution using a task delay. Second, it flushes its KitTO telemetry pipe. And third, it reads and processes all packets on its KitTO ground command pipe. Here's my desktop with three OpenSAT Kit windows displayed. The CFS has already been started and on the right is the CFS console window displaying event messages. In the center is the event service page. I'll be sending a command to turn on KitTO debug events. KitTO has debug events that are sent when packets are read off either of its software bus pipes. On the left, I have part of the runtime app screen showing. I'll be sending a command to KitTO to change the main loop's delay time from 500 milliseconds to 1000 milliseconds. This will slow down the rate of the debug messages to make it easier to track them in the console window. After I send the delay time change command, we'll also see some software bus overflow messages. In this particular situation, I wanted these messages to occur for illustrative purposes. For a real system, these are important messages in terms of tuning system configurations and should not be ignored. So now I'm going to send the delay. I'm going to change it from, it's currently at 500 milliseconds by default, and I will change it to 1,000 milliseconds. So we see the event message saying that delay changed from 500 to 1,000, and here we're starting to get a couple overflow messages. These should settle out as uh, the system syncs back up with the buffers and a slower time. And I think the way the system is right now, they, they won't persist. It'll still actually work, but during this transition period, we'll see some event messages. So now I'm going to turn on KitTO's debug events. And trust me that the bit mask of one is for that. Um, unfortunately, this uh, menu is not very clear with that, but I will send it. So now what we're going to start seeing is each time a package read off the bus, we're going to get a, we're going to get an event message. Actually, the way it works is after the, all of the telemetry packets are flushed from the telemetry queue, queue, we get a message. So we see this, we got 10 messages from telemetry pipe 10, now we just took the housekeeping request. So if I go down to here again and I send a no-op, we'll also see that the KitTO received a, a no-op command off its command pipe. It's also continuing to get the housekeeping request. And now we see those overflow messages have settled out and we're simply flushing the telemetry packet each after each delay. And every three to four seconds, we're getting a housekeeping packet request. This is the high-level application flowchart that was introduced in the CFE overview lesson. I will step through it and highlight some common software bus usages. During initialization, apps create pipes and subscribe to messages on their pipes. The regular subscribe function uses defaults for quality of service and number of buffers for the messages being subscribed to. The subscribe EX version lets the caller explicitly define these items. KitTO uses the EX version for its telemetry pipe 
and the default version for its command pipe. Another common practice during initialization is to initialize headers of packets that the application will send. For example, the housekeeping packet header can be initialized at this time. The app design tutorials will cover using the software bus for data and control flow in more detail. In general, every app typically does a received message call at some point, and many apps send messages as a result of the main loop processing. The housekeeping cycle is when an app sends its housekeeping packet, so it will timestamp the message and send it. Usually no software bus processing is required when an app is about to exit. However, there are some rare cases when releasing a zero copy pointer or buffer may be required. By default, the CCSDS space packet standard is used for messages. The CFS was created by NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and all of its in-house missions use CCSDS standards for their ground to space communications link. Using the same ground to space packet format for the software bus simplifies CFS apps that provide external interfaces. The primary packet is four bytes as shown here and is always in network byte ordering or Big Indian. The version number is currently set to zero. The packet type is set to zero for telemetry and one for commands. The secondary header flag is always set to one since the CFS uses secondary headers for both its command and telemetry packets. The app ID defines which app owns the packet. The sequence flags are used for data that spans more than one packet. Currently, none of the open source apps use this feature. The packet sequence count is incremented each time a message is sent. A packet sequence count change can be used when you need to verify that data isn't stale. Finally, the last field of the primary header is the packet length. The CFE's executive service command and housekeeping message IDs are shown as examples. Both packets have the secondary header flag set to one as indicated by the second digit being an eight, and the command packet has a packet type set to one. The app IDs are simply numbers that have been assigned to executive services within OpenSAT Kit. Here are a few more important notes about software bus messages. Terminology can be confusing. You may read or hear the terms packet ID, message ID, and stream ID. The packet ID is technically the CCSDS 11-bit app ID field, while the terms message ID and stream ID refer to the entire 16-bit word of the primary header. The command secondary header contains a command function code and a checksum. The CFS app convention is to define a single ground command message and then use the function code to identify individual commands. The telemetry secondary header contains a timestamp of when the data in the packet was produced. It is the responsibility of the data producer to update the telemetry packet timestamp. Applications should not directly manipulate packet header fields. Read and write accessor functions should be used. A list of these functions is provided in the OpenSAT Kit software bus training slides and the software bus documentation. Finally, the CCSDS space packet standard was updated to extend the app ID. CFE 6.6 .6 supports this new feature and it will be covered in detail in another OpenSAT Kit tutorial. Important aspects of working with the software bus include system integration and tuning the resources used by the software bus. First, message IDs must be managed to ensure that there aren't any conflicts between apps and they also must be defined for the flight software and for Cosmos. On the left is the CPU1 underscore message ID header file contained in the CFS slash OSK underscore desk directory, and it defines the message IDs for the flight software. On the right is flight software message IDs dot RB for Ruby, and it's contained in the Cosmos lib directory that defines the message IDs for Cosmos. Currently, it is a manual process to update these files and to ensure that they have consistent definitions. In the future, message IDs will be defined in a single location with tool support for automated file generation. There are a couple resources available to help tune the software bus resource usage. I still have the console window open, but KitTO is back to its default state of a 500 millisecond delay in its main loop, and its debug events are disabled. The CFS terminal window is still being displayed on the right. I'll be using the software bus screen to highlight some of the resources available to you. You can launch this screen from the main screen of OpenSAT Kit. This screen has three parts. The ground interface is for sending commands, displaying telemetry, 
and also for dumping information to files and then displaying those files. The second part of the screen can launch tutorial information, such as the training slides or exercise scripts. And a third part of the screen contains status from SB's housekeeping packet. As you can see, we have many buffer overflows as expected. Also notice we have no subscriber messages. This is expected because the KitTO scheduler app is sending messages that don't have subscribers. In a production system, you'd want to confirm the source of these errors and make the appropriate changes to remove them. There are many features to show you in a brief tutorial. There are too many features to show in a brief tutorial, so I'll highlight two that are most helpful when configuring a system. The first is the software bus statistics packet. So we can bring this packet up by using the command here to display the telemetry. And this is gonna launch the Cosmos packet viewer. So we'll see the whole packet. And as you can see, it's all zeros. And the reason for this is because this packet is only sent in response to a command. So we'll go ahead and send the display stats or send the stats packet command. And we'll see that it gets populated. And some of the fields to notice are pipes in use, peak pipes in use, some other memory statistics. And if you notice, it has information on each of the pipes. But if you also notice, we don't know which pipes these are. So in order to get that information, we can actually use this next command. And this is going to send the command to dump the pipe information to a file. And then that file will automatically be transferred to the ground. So here we see that sulfur bus pipe data was written. Then TFTP was automatically um, invoked to transfer the file. And then next we see that a window popped up here to launch Cosmos Table Manager. And this gives you instructions for which files to select when you open Table Manager. So I'm gonna launch Table Manager and we need to open the file sulfur bus pipe .dat. And there's a default location for CFS kit file server. And there we see the pipe that that file. And it's the one with the most recent time. So it's at the top, which is convenient. Now these are binary files. So you're gonna need another file to interpret the information in a file. So the next Cosmos already directs you to the right directory. And here's all the text files that define the binary information. Once again, we open the pipe file. Now we get this error message. It's really a warning. So the pipe definition file is for the maximum number of pipes. And since the binary file that we dump doesn't have the maximum number defined, Cosmos is warning us that there won't, all the fields won't be filled in. So now we have our pipe information file being displayed in Cosmos Table Manager. And basically it's gonna have the name of the owner of a pipe, the app name, and a couple other inf some, some other information about the pipe. Now, KitTO is what we're interested in right now, and since that's loaded last, or close to last in the startup script, it's going to be towards the end of all these pipes. So we scroll down, and here we see it. So we found both of KitTO's pipes. Here's the packet pipe that's for receiving all the telemetry packets, and here's the command pipe. So for the packet pipe, it's pipe ID 18. And as we, it's got a Q depth of 100, as we expect. And as you can see, we have many errors on it, as we expected because of the overflows. Now, if we go back to our statistics packet, we can scroll down to pipe 18. And we see that pipe 18 has a depth of 100. And the key kind of information that we're seeing here is that its peak in use was only 10, 10 out of the 100. So those buffer overflows are definitely a result of the buffer limits for each message ID being too low. Of course, we were playing with the delay time, so um, it was breaking some of the tuning that's already been done to this system. But anyway, the idea here was to get you in a, a, a sense of that there's a lot of resources that you can explore and in order to get the information you need to help tune your system. Finally, I'd like to mention the zero copy send feature. This is another tuning feature that can be uh, used and it's, uh, it, it allows the sender and receiver to use a pointer mode. 
and this eliminates a buffer copy used by the normal message transfer, so it can be used to optimize performance for a high-speed message communication path. So I hope this has been helpful, and this concludes the software bus tutorial. Thanks for tuning in.